Our guest today on the bridge, Kevin Morby. This is a photograph out on Dead Oceans. I said this to you earlier, but it's just a spectacular record. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, too. You know, the thing that, and this is just, um, this is just personal praise, but so much of the music that we get today is following a formula. You know, you have to be to the chorus by 60 seconds in. You can't have a long intro. It's got to have a certain structure, you know. And um, your albums, you're kind of chasing art. You know, you're trying to build a story and a world. And so I appreciate that quite a bit. Thank you. very. Thanks for noticing. Thank you. You know, you're also appearing at Knuckleheads November 3rd. I want to make sure and get that out. When I go back and look at your story, there is one part of it that I have wanted to ask you about for years. Okay. And it, it sort of, I, we all love to sort of categorize people, sort them, put them into different groups. And I do believe that there are two types of people out there, people who liked their high school years uh-huh. and people who didn't. Sure, sure. And I am in the didn't camp. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I, I was very much trying to figure out life and my place in it. And I think that you were in that same group. But your answer was to drop out of high school and get on a train you had never visited New York, but you got on a train to New York right. with $500 with the goal of lasting at least a year. So I guess my first question is, what were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think uh, I, don't, I wasn't thinking very much. I was just sort of following um, I, what I felt like the universe was trying to tell me. You know, I think getting out of high school early was such a significant part of that for my story because... It was good for me to sort of be slapped by reality a little bit. I had this year from 17 to 18 where I kind of saw my life, you know, should I not make some sort of big change? So I, you know, I, yeah, I went to New York City. I, I took the train there and I, I, I'd only flown once before in my childhood. And the idea of being able to get on an airplane and two hours later somehow be in New York City, this place I'd never been and sort of culturally, you know, was a significant place growing up and I'd only see it in films and, and read about it in books. I was literally too terrified and I couldn't wrap my mind around the fact that I could just be there in two hours by stepping into this flying vessel. So I didn't do that. I took the train. I wanted to gradually go. I wanted to take, I, I wanted to get there slow enough to where at any point I got too freaked out. I could just, you know, get on another train and go back home. But <laughs> luckily I did make it there and it was, it was the right decision for me. And, um, yeah, it was, it was a great, great thing that I did for myself. You know, I was thinking, you started writing songs when you were in seventh grade. Right? And yes, around there. It's, what made you pick up a pen? Um, you know, really just a love for music. For the longest time, um, you know, I would just sort of listen to popular radio. I have an older sister who was constantly listening to music, and I would kind of get CDs that she had been listening or ordered through weird magazine scams or whatever those things were that we would get our records from at the time. Um, but I just had a love for music. I just, I, I, It's one of those things that I heard at an early enough age where I related to it and I found myself saying, you know, this is what I want to do when I grow up. So, you know, to me, it felt like maybe just having that songwriting was maybe enough of a pull that it made getting on that train and going out into the abyss. For sure. (laughs) Possible. Absolutely. I mean, it was all music, you know, and it was all my idols and sort of being encouraged and inspired by Their stories as well, you know, people like Leonard Cohen or Bob Dylan, people who left their hometowns and went to sort of search for this greater thing. I really relate because now I live here, you know, I I left here for 12 years and I couldn't wait to get out of Kansas City. I was trying to escape it. And then now I have such a new um, a, a, a new love for it and a new appreciation for it. I saw Bruce Springsteen on Broadway a couple years ago and he was talking about he's like, I'm I'm Mr. Thunder Road. I'm Johnny 99. He's like, I live 10 minutes from where I grew up. And I really relate to that. You know, I think so much of the journey is sort of going out and gathering these experiences and coming back. Um, so, so yeah, but music has always guided me. It's always, I've always just followed the music and gone where it's taken me. You know, when you got there, you ended up in a couple of bands, uh, Woods and the Babies, and, but you were also writing songs that really didn't fit either ensemble. Yeah. And so you, you became a solo act uh, and, and moved out to L.A., Somewhere along the way, you sort of fell into this, I love this sort of passed down knowledge. It started in the Band X, then it went to Kim Deal, and then, yeah, yeah. And then it went to Deer Hunter, yeah. and then it came to you, the advice that led you back to us. Sure. Yeah, yeah, that's a funny thing. Bradford Cox from Deer Hunter, I'd stayed at his place 
uh, on a tour with Kate Lebon and he had uh, he was in he has this beautiful house and you know he told me if Kim Deal once said to me if you ever get enough money to buy a house you should do it immediately and um, so I did I bought a house here in downtown Overland Park my dad had fixed up um, he was flipping houses at the time and it was a great investment for me as a, a musician who finally got money for the first time in my life really and yeah a couple years later I was in Australia playing shows with Kim Deal and I told her that and she said that Johnny Bonebreak from Exit told her given her that same advice um, so any young indie rockers out there, you know, if you get enough money from anything, buy, buy a house in your hometown. That's, I'm you, passing down that advice. So you get the house, and then, well, like, what do you do with it? And it was part refuge, part recording studio by the time you got done. For sure. I think so much of the anxiety that comes from being an artist, especially in today's economy and climate is just not having any security. You know, for the longest time I was going on tour with my, my young bands and there was just, just no money, you know, it was, you would lose money on tour, but you're doing it sort of for the love of it. But as you start to get older and you realize you have no other skills in any other, any way, other way of making money, really, you start to want to get smart with whatever money you are fortunate enough to make, especially doing something that you love. So um, when I first got that house, I was still living in Los Angeles, but a, a friend of mine was actually living there for a while. And it's just sort of a place I knew at the end of the day, you know, if, uh, if nothing else, I had a place to make music and a place to live. You know, as long as we're talking about home, let's talk about really one of the driving things to making this record, January 2020, mm -hmm. you're sitting around at your sister's house, family dinner, and your dad, thankfully, he is fine, mm -hmm. but he had a moment. He had a moment. It's a moment, a mortality moment, which I think, you know, just makes everyone look at themselves and look at their loved ones. And um, yeah, luckily he was okay, and, and he's sitting right there. <laughs> he's in good health. Um, but uh um, you know, it's just one of those life moments that it's, it's so easy to, to go day by day and not think about how fragile life is. And every once in a while you have a reminder, luckily this reminder had a, a good outcome, but it was something that sort of creatively sparked me on this journey that ended up being this record. You know, and I think as we all grow older, there is that moment where all of a sudden you realize, oh, I'm a caregiver for my parents. Uh -huh. Right. For so sure. this is why they had me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 Hope I don't screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> you sure? Sure. Yeah, yeah, I have been there. Um, so after, you know, it quickly realized that everything was going to be fine, you went back to the family home and started going through family pictures. Mm -hmm. And there was one in particular that resonated with you. Yes, it was my father as a young man, but it, it, he was we sort of did the math on it and he was the age that I was there in that moment looking at the photograph. Um, and it also would have been the year that I was born. So it felt like the significant photo to the experience we had all just had. And it, yeah, it just felt like very kismet. Like this night was sort of telling us something or that photo was having a conversation with that experience. And I couldn't help but just sort of take stock or, um, you know, it wasn't lost on me that there was, there was something there. And with songwriting, a lot of times, it's not like something happens and you get this light bulb goes off in your head and you think you're going to write a song about it. I often view it as therapy where it's something happens or you, you witness something or whatever it is, and it sort of burrows inside of you. And like in talk therapy, it can later come out. You know, I'll be playing guitar, I'll be working on a song, and then suddenly these feelings and these ideas come out. And I think, oh, it's that thing from, you know, a couple months ago. Cycle of life, passage of time, nothing heavy there at all. <laughs> a photograph a window to the past of your father on the front lawn with no shirt on ready to take the world on beneath the West Texas sun the year that you were born the year that you are now his wife behind the camera His daughter and his baby boy Got a glimmer in his eye Seem to say, this is what I'll miss about being alive And this is what I'll miss after I die My body My girls My boy the sun. Now 
Now time's gonna feed him The heavyweight champ Laughing in his face As he danced like Sugar Ray Used to be, come on, come on But now, no mas, no mas Used to be, come on, come on But now, no mas, no mas And this is a photograph A window to the past Of your mother in a skirt In the cool Kentucky dirt Laughing in the garden Back where it all started Got a smile on her face Everything in its place Got a glimmer in her eye Seem to say This is what I'll miss about being alive This is what I'll miss about being alive This is what I'll miss about being alive This is what I'll miss after I die This is what I'll miss about being alive This is what I'll miss about being alive This is what I'll miss about being alive This is what I'll miss after I die This is what I'll miss about being alive This is what I'll miss about being alive This is what I'll miss about being alive This is what I'll miss after I die This is a photograph to the past of me on a front line ready to take the world on in the Tennessee sun inside the kingdom got a glimmer in my eye seem to say you know uh, this is a photograph obviously inspired by the photograph that you saw but Originally, you were kind of viewing it almost like, uh, you know, it reminded me a little bit of Yoko Ono, right? It's mm -hmm. like you were going to have the captions to the photographs in, uh, in a book, but then not include the photographs. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it was this idea that I had a couple days after seeing uh, that, that box of photographs that we unearthed. I was on a flight to a European tour. I was going somewhere in France. And I had this idea of this collection of, I guess they would be poems, but... Yeah, maybe a very Yoko-esque uh, sort of art piece that would be photographs, but it's just words. So it's a, this is a photograph of, you know, Kansas City, Missouri, but it would just be that text. And so your idea of what that is would kind of be projected onto it. So I had this idea and then later it turned it into a song. Our guest today on The Bridge is Kevin Morby. The new album, This Is a Photograph, is out on Dead Oceans and he'll be playing Thursday, November 3rd over at Knuckleheads. So let's talk a little bit about the pandemic. Uh, everybody put it to different use. Your mm -hmm. original use for the pandemic was to go stir crazy. Yes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I think a lot of experience, especially, you know, it was twofold for me because there was something great about the pandemic being a touring artist. You know, I tour so often, you know, most of my years spent out on the road. So I'd always, there's always these things that me and my peers are constantly talking about. Oh, when we're in our 50s and 60s, we'll get a garden or we'll do this thing. And then suddenly, in the blink of an eye, we, we were able to do all of those things. So there was this very sort of nice, healthy environment um, in the day-to-day -day of literally having a garden and sleeping correctly and eating at the right times. All things that you can't do when you're on the road constantly. It really made me realize just how unhealthy of a person I was <laughs> up until that point. There's a couple photographs from like August 2020 compared to August 2019 where you really see the vast difference. Just And it's just a, a light in my eyes <laughs> yeah. um, that had gone out, out there on the road. But, you know, but at the same time, I really missed those things. And the world was terrifying and there was the virus and it was all to the backdrop of this sort of chaos going on. So though I was healthier, it seemed like the world was very unhealthy. Um, and I really missed being able to do what, you know, what, what I love to do, which is play music and um, tour my songs around the world. So now that the world's opened back up, it's, it's kind of trying to find the, the, the middle, you know, the, the best of both worlds. So you decided to go to Memphis and hang out at the Peabody, mm -hmm. which is like I've been there and it's <laughs> just uh, it's hard to describe. Uh, the world stops for the ducks to walk through the lobby <laughs> yes. twice a day. Yeah, it's true. I love the people. I, you know, I think a great way of describing it, especially to someone who's never been there, if they've seen Home Alone 2 Lost in New York, when Kevin McAllister goes to the Plaza Hotel, it's something similar to that, where just sort of this grand, it feels like I shouldn't be there. It feels like I'm, 
why would they let me through the front doors? But, you know, during this time period, during COVID, during 2020, the vacancy was so low, they upgraded me to the suite and it was very affordable. And it just kind of, it was where I took this sort of creative refuge for a few weeks. And um, yeah, it was a very surreal experience. I've stayed there again since then. And it's still a wonderful, great place, but it's, it's a much different experience than I was having. You know, they should just rename room 409 the Kevin Morby suite. You yes. Made, you, got, you got a whole album out of it. You're getting them all this publicity. It's the least they can You know, do. what's funny is I was doing um, an article where they're sending a writer from the New York Times to meet me in Memphis. And I was like, oh, I want to get the room 409. That's the room that I stayed in. And like I said, it was this big suite and I had this recording set up there. It was this really neat thing that I had going. And I, I wanted to get it. And I, I called the hotel and they were completely booked up all week. And I was like, I can't believe that that hotel is completely full. But the Grizzlies, the Memphis Grizzlies had made it to the playoffs. And uh. so the first week of, of that, so we didn't get to go there, but I had, I scrawled my name underneath one of like the, there's like a little beauty nook there. And I'd gone in and under one of the tables scrawled my name. And so I was hoping I could show him that, but, but uh, no, it's back to business as usual. So, so years from now, Kevin Morby fans are going to be checking into room 409 to look for that, right? <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, it's under the beauty nook bench. So, that's so the, the thing that got me about it is I, knowing how intentional you are with the album that you're going to make, I just have this feeling that you went to Memphis not because it's a beautiful hotel and you could get a cheap rate. Correct. It wasn't because of that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and there are there. So let's talk about that a little bit. There are many ghosts that go through a lot of your albums. Mm -hmm. And so you spend time with a lot of those ghosts during the day while you were in Memphis. For you sure. Know, like Elvis, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, of course, uh, Tim Buckley. Mm -hmm. Jeff Buckley. Jeff yeah, Buckley. Yeah, yeah, Jeff Buckley. yeah. Brain. Yeah. <laughs> um, but in any case, so many people with so many ties to Memphis. Um, so, the one that I think really sort of impacted the album a lot was Buckley. Yes, yeah, for sure. Jeff Buckley was a big influence on it. I think all those people that you just named and everyone else, you know, like Chris Bell from Big Star or Big Star in general, um, anyone from Stax Records, you know, Otis Redding or Isaac Hayes, any of those people's stories I found very inspiring at this time um, for a couple of different reasons, but mainly because there's a lot of tragedy that surrounds Memphis. And I think Memphis, unlike a lot of other American cities really does a good job at sort of remembering its past. Uh, best example of that is probably the Lorraine motel being the civil rights museum. And, you know, you can still go there and see Martin Luther King Jr.'s bed, uh, is un unmade from the moment that he was assassinated, uh, from the morning that he was assassinated. I think they do a really good job at sort of, you know, turning these sorts of things into a museum. So we don't for forget our past. And, there's a lot of tragedy that's happened there. So it felt like I was at once going to a place that I knew was a resilient city that had experienced a lot of tragedy and a lot of trauma. I wanted to go there and experience that because I felt we were all collectively experiencing this global tragedy. It felt like Memphis is this brave place. It's not going to be afraid of something like a virus. It's, it's already been through so much. It survived so much. So there was that. But I also found it comforting that all these people who had died, whose stories I was so enamored in, they had died before this virus. There was something about the fact that they were untouched by this virus or they didn't have to um, ever exist in this strange, strange time that we have to exist in. There was some comfort there. It's like I could revisit their stories and sort of take comfort in the fact that uh, I was mentally sort of existing in their time periods, which as complicated as those time periods were, it, it felt less complicated in the present because of what was happening with COVID. So how did you find the, the butterfly connection to the Buckley story? I, you know, I was deep in some Reddit threads, just really following, <laughs> I, I kind of describe him as sort of self, self-guided, um, rock and roll tours through Memphis and Jeff Buckley's story, I think really jumped out at me, uh, above everyone else's. He wasn't from the South like myself. I'm not from the South. He's from California and he'd done time in New York, two places that I've done a lot of time in. And he was drawn to Memphis, I think, and from everything I can gather for very similar reasons that I was, I think he's trying to touch on some root of America or, you know, some heart of America that felt feels you can access in that city. Um, and while he was there and while he was trying to get close to that, you know, he tragically passed away. He drowned in the Mississippi river, but I was reading all of these things about him that I also found relatable kind of what I was just saying about 
my 2020 and wanting to settle down a little bit, but not knowing how to do that when a crazy touring schedule, but all of these things about how he was trying to purchase a home that wasn't for sale, that he was trying to buy a car that also wasn't for sale. And he had volunteered for a butterfly shift at the, uh, at the butterfly garden in the Memphis zoo, which I found so peculiar, but so relatable. It just felt like something that me or one of my friends would do in our off time on the road, because you go out there and you live this like rock star life, but then you get home and you, you have actually no idea what to do. I was driving over here today and I was like, thank God I have something to do today. <laughs> um, because when I'm not out there doing this thing, it's, it's, I'm, a, I'm, you're, I'm kind of weightless. And so, you know, the Memphis Zoo kind of became this strange place that I was hanging out at, which zoos are very strange in general, but especially in Memphis in 2020 during the pandemic, it was a very weird place for just a grown man to be going to alone <laughs> to sit there. And I like had a little audio recorder, like taking audio of the birds and things like that. Yeah. But, you know, um, there, there is this memorial there for him. It's right by the Tigers. It's um, that Columbia Records donated to, to him after he passed away. Um, it's, a little, you know, it's a little plaque that says, rest in peace, Jeff Buckley. And so it's a, it's a cool place. So you took that recorder down to where he went into the water and mm-hmm. recorded the water sounds from that site. Yep, which you can, yeah, you can hear on the record on, on the song, on a coat of butterflies. You mentioned Stax being a, a big part of your attraction as well. They have a music program, and you actually use some of the students. Yeah, the Stax Academy. We we had five different very talented singers come in, and it was actually school was out of session um, when we were working there at the Sam Phillips Recording Company in August of 2021. So we had a few of the alumni come in, and they're wonderful. And then uh, two of them uh, came and just sang with me on Jimmy Kimmel last week, which is really cool. And they're, I mean, the thing is, it's they're they're incredibly talented. They're way more talented than me. Um, so it was an honor to 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 play with all of them, and they the record's all the better for it. Out of time, out of money Out of time, out of money Honey Out of lust Out of lust, out of trust Out of lust, out of trust For the sky above my head Sun came up through my hands Sun came up With no plan Sun came up Strike up the band Out of grace Out of grace, out of style Out of grace, out of style Can you Sit a little while Out of dreams So it seems The nightmares Will greet me at my bed Shut me up If you can Shut me up Take my hand Shut me up, be my friend Through a random act of kindness Out of town Out of town for the moment Out of town for the moment I'll be back tomorrow Out of sight Out of nowhere out of sorrow, out of thin air, out of spite, out of light, out of loneliness, out of soldiers in the moonlight, casting shadows, twirling dancers, cross their bodies, cross the water, cross the universe. Lift me up by my hand Lift me up if you can 
Lift me up, be my friend Through a random act of kindness Oh, one that's done from blindness Sun came up 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 Thank you very much. Our guest today on the bridge is Kevin Morby, who is going to be at Knuckleheads on November 3rd. Let's talk about the recording of the album. Uh, so you've you spent the three weeks sort of being a tourist mm -hmm. and following you know, the different stories during the day and then coming back and writing at night. But you did some early recording uh, up in with Sam Cohen. Yep, Sam Cohen, correct. And he was building a studio, so the early stuff was in his basement. Yes, the early stuff, he was he was renting a house where he had like a little makeshift recording rig in a basement. So the first session we did there, and um, it was still, you know, we'd kind of viewed that session of we're going to have a bunch of friends come by and, and, and play and get everyone back in a room because it's November of 2020, and we thought surely by then this COVID thing would be in the rearview mirror. Um but, you know, while I was driving out there, the, the governor of New York had put the mandate back into effect. So it was just basically me and Sam and our friend Nick. So it was the first session. And Sam was having this studio built. He's, he was living in New York City, but he moved up there during the pandemic with his family. He's having a studio built from the ground up. And it was ready in the spring. So I think it's the first record that he made in there. It was, it, you know, had that new studio smell. And it was great. And we, we were up there for like about a month. It's the most time I've ever um, spent solely working on a record, which is another thing that COVID kind of allowed for, like having a garden or like getting regular sleep and eating all at the same <laughs> times a day. I was able to go into a studio for the first time and not have to go back out on the road after a week or whatever. And I was really able to dig in up there. And we spent about a month up there. You know, your previous record had intentionally been kind of stripped down. But after having been through the pandemic, I get the sense that you just wanted to be people for sure yeah we so wanted to, yeah bring in the horns <laughs> bring yeah. in the harp absolutely yeah. yeah we we were it would it really was that it was kind of just invite that friend over we'll find some reason for them to get on the record we just wanted to hang out with people so this album had been so inspired by memphis you felt like you had to go back to finish it in memphis yeah yeah you know a lot of times when i've written a record about a place i'll intentionally not record there so you know I have a record uh, called City Music, which is about New York City, but we intentionally went to like a beach town in Northern California to record it because I kind of like the muse to be sort of unreachable and just sort of exist there in my mind. So, you know, sometimes if I go to work in a place, I'll have this magical idea of it. But then when you're there, you're just, you know, you're, you're going to Whole Foods every day and running errand. You know, it's, it just becomes this kind of place like anywhere else and the magic stripped away. But for this, I've, I felt that, you know, I really wanted to go to Memphis and it felt appropriate for how big of a role it played in the subject matter for it to sort of sonically be represented as well. You know, Sam Phillips had a radio station in the Peabody. Yeah. And so then you're in Sam Phillips studios, which mm -hmm. are an offshoot of the old Sun Studios mm -hmm. to record. Did you, did going through Sun Studios and being there with, with Sam's son sort of overseeing the studio, did that make you feel the ghosts? Absolutely. You know, Sun, so it wasn't done in Sun. It was done at uh, Sam Phillips Recording Studio, which is right down the street from right. Sun. And like you said, he got after Sun Studios. But I had toured Sun, and I, you know, for whatever it's worth, I did feel some sort of spirit or whatever. You know, there is a vibe when you walk in there, and you're like, something magical time and time again has happened in this room. And I, I certainly believe in all that stuff for Memphis at large. And again, that's why I think it's so such a rare and important city because it, it does that thing. You can walk into the past there and you can feel those, um, you can feel the air, you know? Um, but working there and certainly with, uh, Jerry Phillips, Sam Phillips son, sort of as our, our guide within the studio, 
it made a bigger impression on me than I really thought. I thought we we're going to go into an old room that felt cool, but you know, every day we would go have like a drink at the, the, the bar that Sam Phillips had built for Elvis and Johnny Cash after they got too famous to go to public bars. And it's like this little bar and there's stains, cigarette stains still on the bar from where Johnny Cash would put his cigarettes out and things like that. So it, it felt like touching greatness and touching the past. And Jerry Phillips is such a cool guy. And yeah, it was, it was very, very magical those four days in that studio. You know, uh, the magic must have a draw because you got to officiate a wedding. There. I did. I did. An, <laughs> I did officiate a wedding, my girlfriend's twin sister's wedding and uh, Allison and her husband, Mike. After COVID hit, they were supposed to have this big wedding in, in Los Angeles, like 300 people. But then it ended up being six people in, in Sun Studios. It was very cool. It was kind of the world was, you know, that happens often with a record or just in life, I suppose, where all these things converge and point you towards a certain place. And um, Katie's from the South and her family ended up going to Memphis all the time for vacation when she was younger. So she certainly helps with my fascination of it. You know, there are so many great people on this record. I was really taken with Aaron Ray mm -hmm. and uh, the gentleman from the Fruit Bats. Yep, Eric. Eric. Yeah. Yeah. It's a beautiful track. Yeah, thank you. They're amazing. Aaron's so incredible and um I've been a big fan for a long time and we we've been friends over the years and again it was kind of just one of those things where coming out of the pandemic I just wanted to collaborate with as many people as possible. So I you know, I was like Eric plays banjo, this song should be on banjo. Eric should be in the room and Aaron's one of those people that I just I I yeah, her talent is is so huge. I don't think I'd ever ask anyone else to sing first in the song. You know, it's a duet, but she opens the song. You hear her voice first, which is, especially in streaming culture, I feel like a lot of people hear that song, and they're not going to think it's a Kevin Morby song because I don't sound like Aaron Ray, but I'm honored to have her on the song, and she's so great. You brought the pump organ today. Mm -hmm. uh, your, your grandmother had an organ. Was that the inspiration? You know, um, I like to think that my, my grandma, my grandma Dorothy, um, she... She certainly she was an amazing musician, and she she was always playing organ growing up. So I there's definitely a, a tie there for me being a musician, and she was the musician in the family. The pump organ, I, I got fascinated with these things a couple years ago. I the, I like anything that is that mechanical, you know, like a bicycle where it, it, you know you have to it, it it'll push you along, but you you have to give it something back, and that's what this organ's like. It's actually pretty exhausting to play, but you it's cool. Got that at a thrift shop. I got that at a thrift shop. I am here. going to the wrong thrift shop. <laughs> you and I are going to have to have a conversation when this, this is over. I forget what it, it's 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 in Overland Park. I think actually now it's a new location, but it's one of those things. I just moved back, and I was out there searching around, and I was saying earlier that. I was willing to throw down thousands of dollars for this thing, but then they were like, it was, it's it, because it, coming from living in Los Angeles and New York, something like that would be thousands of dollars at an antique shop. But they were like, well, it's $200. And I was like, <laughs> feels good to be home. <laughs> so you've been writing some different things, um, short fiction, poems, you've been painting. Is there any like, physical paper style things coming from you in the future? Well, um, very glad you asked because I had a photo show recently um, in New York City on the uh, leading up to the release of my record. And I made a lot of these things and I only sold a few of these things. So <laughs> we're about to put them online. We're about to put them online and um, I'm going to take them on tour and just do whatever it takes to sell all these things. So <laughs> if anyone's interested, get, it, get in contact. They're all photos that I took um, at the time that I was living at the Peabody and writing. And I would uh, just from wandering around Memphis and a lot of the things that ended up in the subject matter there, uh, there's photos of them. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the there's, very a, nice. there's a lot of great resources. You just started up a Substack. Yes. So, you know, if you want to go to Kevin's website, find that address, lots of different places to get good information. Yeah. Uh, this has just um, been like a true joy. Thank you. I don't know why this, has, I'm sorry that it's taken me so long to get here. This uh, is great. Yeah, well, likewise. I think we both try, have tried at different points to make the connection, uh, but schedules never lined up and it's long overdue. Um, you know, I'm going to embarrass Kevin just a second. It, you don't have to look on the internet very far to find somebody who's saying that Kevin is one of the, if not the best songwriter in the United States right now. So that's very kind of whoever says that might be my parents. But. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to check their phones. Yeah. To, you know, <laughs> Keep see, burner but, accounts. Yeah. Uh, but again, brilliant album, November 3rd at, at uh, Knuckleheads. Uh, Kevin Morby, thanks for joining thanks us. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. I know that I'm not perfect. Just like I know you a while I know that though we're both grown up I still feel like a child inside 
And I want to go out dancing Soon as the world returns Cause Katie, when you're dressed up Well, it's hard to find the words And if you looked into my soul And you told me what you see You'd say I see the mirror That you put in front of me Oh, don't take me to the start No, I want to go forward Baby, if we part Katie, if I hide Then I can live in your songs forever And you can live in mine Cause Katie, when you sing to me It's like a melody e, e, Coming off the mountain e, Coming out the sea e, e, Stopping at the plains Up into a Memphis sky Katie, stop the song now Stop before I cry Stop before I cry Stop before I cry I Stop before I cry I Stop before I cry And you know they'll feed us fruit Right before they suck our blood Yeah, they'll fill us up with sugar While they drag us through the mud And it's hard to find the freedom That we feel when we're asleep Cause right now I am wide awake Always stuck inside a dream And I know that you got secrets And you know I got them too Cause you see me ride a nightmare, honey And you taught me how to shoot Oh, remember when we met How we were so young You were still sucking on a bottle Like it was sucking on God's thumb But from stage you would take flight And whistle like a songbird Swaying in a blue dress You turn the crowd into a big mess Cause Katie, when you sing to me It's like a melody e, e, Coming off the mountain e, Coming out the sea e, e, Stopping at the plains Up into a Memphis sky Katie, stop the song now Stop before I cry 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 You can get lost forever When your heart is a desert And you can lose your mind When it's storming all the time But I wanna go out dancing Soon as the world returns Cause Katie, when you're dressed up, honey Oh, it's hard to find the words